This is Sam Long. I'm Ron Peters. And I'm John Newton. Welcome to the After Class Podcast. Because the best conversations happen after class. Thanks for joining us another episode of the After Class Podcast. We're glad to have you along. Uh, this is a nice, brisk fall morning, afternoon, as it is in uh, Michigan, so we're happy to enjoy that. Some of us like the cool air. Others, our Florida students, don't like it, and I tell <laughs> them, wait, it gets worse. <laughs> it uh, gets worse. worse. But uh, it was a nice day. And uh, a couple quick reminders, or at least one. Uh, if you're listening to this on Monday when it releases, then uh, you have time to still listen in to the Restoration Appreciation Lectures that will be happening next week. Uh, on Tuesday and on Friday on the tw- 26th and 25th. 22nd and 25th. What did I say? 26th and 25th? I meant 22nd. Yep. My mind works sometimes. <laughs> uh, 22nd and 25th. So, you know, tune in. Come on out. If you listen to this days and weeks later, it will mean nothing. I guess you could probably watch them later online somehow. But Yeah, nonetheless. that is true. So we got that going on next week. And uh, we mentioned a couple weeks ago that we are putting, or we did put out a survey about the Grad possible grad program here at, at Great Lakes Christian College. Uh, the vote is in, and the results are, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the results are in on ah, yes. there was a drawing. Like, if you filled out the survey, there was going to be a random <laughs> name drawn from everyone who did the survey, yes. and someone was going to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Now, we haven't... The drawing has happened. We do have a winner. We know who it is. And that person... We're not going to announce it before that person is told personally. So we're just going to say, if if you are part of the His House Christian Fellowship and have a His House Christian Fellowship email address, <laughs> you <laughs> may be one of the people. There were several people from His House that filled out the survey. Oh, there's more than uh, one. Okay. One of you uh, is the winner, and uh, you'll be reached out to very soon, and we'll receive your prize. So anyway, if uh, that's not you, sorry you didn't win. You can try our next survey. You can try the next survey. But the results are really good. There's there's a lot of interest in the program. I, I think that's probably enough for us to um, go forward in applying for uh, accreditation status. Um, so the wheels are moving and in motion, but we cannot say that there is a program yet. Sure, we can't not even say close. That there's an accredited <laughs> program. You know, we're not there, but... Um, the wheels are in motion, and if, if graduate school is something that you've thought about and you'd like a kind of a, an MA in practical theology uh, in the near future, um, think of Great Lakes as one of your possible options. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Exciting times. Yeah. I mean, I look forward all to of us are looking forward yeah. to teaching in a grad program. Very much so. Uh, Very much so. All right. Well, uh, in the meantime, yeah, you're stuck with us. You get graduate level material in the form of a podcast. <laughs> That's mm. right. It's just true. Maybe. Yeah. Right? I mean, I lots of people say this is their ministerial continuing education and how they're going deeper and further in the scripture and in the word. No, I, it's, it's kind of funny to say it, but when you stop and think about it, that's exactly right. You know, that a lot of people either can't afford it or they just don't have the time, but they can listen to the podcast. And, and we're happy to provide this kind of a service. I'm so glad that we can talk about these things. And there are a lot of people out there who just want to listen in on our conversation. Well, I tell people that's all a podcast is it's three people talking, and everybody gets to listen over our shoulders. So glad we could provide this awkwardly. Service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This. It's, this past weekend, we had uh, Alumni Weekend, mm-hmm. which is a great kind of reunion for the 75th anniversary of Great Lakes. And I spoke with uh, Cindy Kleppel, okay. uh, the wife of one of my psychology professors when I was a student at Great Lakes. Same. Same and, here, yep. uh, yeah, so we all had classes with Ron Kleppel. Anyway, Cindy stumbled across our podcast in recent weeks, and she started listening oh. to it. And she said, she really likes it. Great. So she's kind of started at the beginning, just working her way mm. through. Uh, <laughs> she's a lot. got a lot to work through. Um, I feel bad for her. <laughs> it's, uh, so it's always fun to hear about the people who are listening. I, I mean, I feel honored that the wife yeah. of one of my professors like, is learning something and finding the podcast valuable. But it is no substitute for graduate school because, you know, this is like you just listening to us, and you're filling in all the gaps with your own brain, right? right? You're, you're synthesizing what we're saying with what's already in your head, which is why no one who's listening is learning the same thing as anyone else, because <laughs> right, yeah. you always interpret only through the things that are already in your brain and in your frame of reference. Um, but the difference between in-person or even Zoom back and forth instruction is, you know, you get to say out loud what you think you hear us saying, and we get to say, no, that's not what I mean at all. 
right. <laughs> and let's correct. And, this, yeah. Like so, uh, I think uh, we're happy to do be continuing education for as many people as possible. But your uh, your ability to learn is stunted by um, the fact that you're not getting feedback. You're not getting a chance to say out loud what you think you're hearing and getting feedback on whether we think you're hearing us correctly. Right. And so I always have to say to someone, someone else, someone heard you saying this on the podcast. Nope. Didn't say that. <laughs> didn't mean that. Didn't intend that. But you're getting the combination of what they heard us say and what's already in their head, which is seldom exactly what we mean. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> which, which explains a lot of the complaints that people have. What are you teaching at that school? <laughs> uh, what are you teaching your kids that they come up with these ideas already in their head that they're predisposed to hear these things? <laughs> wow. Wow. <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> that was that was very gently harsh. <laughs> Sorry, the New Yorker comes out every once in a while. Okay. So we're continuing our series on divine change. Does God change? Does he does he ever make mid-course corrections? Is he uh receptive to input from his creatures and then does something in response to what he sees us doing or saying? And uh, does he start in one direction and go in another? And, you know, last week, I mean, we went through multiple passages that just flat out state that God was said he was going to do something and then something happened and God changed his mind. And even God in Hosea, I thought we, we spent a lot of time there. Mm-hmm. That God showed his intention to punish his people. And then he says, but wait, I'm not like you people. I'm God. And so... I changed my mind and will not bring upon you the disaster that I said I was going to. And we looked at Jeremiah in the, anil- the analogy of a potter with his clay, that he starts it in one direction and something turns sideways, and he mm. either takes the pot in a different direction or he like just starts all over and kind of makes it a, a giant mass of no form. Right. Um, and, and then starts again to make it something different. Uh, these are the analogies by which God is compared to human things in the scriptures and the way God is interacting with humans. So today we're kind of going into a little bit different direction, but that in a way that develops the same theme, and that is how scripture portrays prayer. Because if God is unchanging, if God is uninfluenceable because he's already decided from the foundation of the world what he's going to do and it's going to happen no matter what, what does that mean? What would that mean for prayer? How would the scriptures present prayer if that's in, in fact what was going on? So we're going we're to sample a few passages and talk about how prayer enters into the discussion. Sure. Uh, so the first one uh, comes from Isaiah 37, and the context is uh, Assyria has surrounded uh, the southern kingdom, surrounded Jerusalem. They've already destroyed the northern kingdom. Now it's the southern kingdom's turn. Hezekiah is the king. He's uh, scared. He's uh, the Rabshakeh is talking mean things to them and saying, just give <laughs> up. In fact, your God told us that this is what he wants us to do. And so they're all freaking out, and Hezekiah does the right thing, and he prays. Uh, And Hezekiah 31, 15 and following, it lists out his prayers. Isaiah? Did I say Isaiah? I said Hezekiah, didn't I? The book of Hezekiah is so good. (laughs) I know, it's fantastic, (laughs) isn't it? Um, Where are we going now? In Isaiah 37. Thank you. uh, Hezekiah prays, and it's it's a nice little prayer. um, But basically he says, you know, God, you know, save us. And then in, in verse 21 it says this, Isaiah, son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning the king of Sennacherib of Assyria, this is the word that Yahweh has spoken concerning you. And he goes through and he has this, this sort of prophetic oracle that really uh, sets up saying, don't worry, his arrogance is going to be his downfall. It won't, he, he, won't take you, he won't take you over, right? He won't destroy Jerusalem. Uh, and, and the story goes on where an angel of the Lord comes and kills 185,000 of them, and, and, they, and they're saved, yay. And it was very like a clear, like Hezekiah saw something on the horizon, he prayed, Isaiah assured him that God had heard his prayer, and this is what was going to happen, that the people were going to be saved, right? Um, there's interestingly, Jeremiah uses, we're kind of debating about whether this is this, this exact incident, or there's a lot going on during this time period. Assyria is pressing all the time uh, at diff- different points, and I'm sure Hezekiah is doing a lot of praying uh, and reaching out to, to, to God for help. Um, but uh, in Jeremiah 26, Jeremiah references another prophet named Micah, uh, and we're, um, they're basically mad at Jeremiah for saying anything bad ever, and, <laughs> Jer- and he's like, you guys remember Micah, right? He said basically the exact same things I'm saying, and did Hezekiah kill him? No. 
He didn't. So stop trying to kill me. It was, <laughs> and uh, so in verse um, 18 of chapter 26 of Jeremiah says, uh, Micah of Morsheth, who prophesied during the days of King Hezekiah of Judah, said to all the people of Judah, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain uh, of the house a wooded height. That's pretty strong language. That basically saying Jerusalem is done. Like it's going under. And then verse 19 says, Did King Hezekiah of Judah and all Judah actually put him to death? Did he not fear Yahweh and entreat the favor of Yahweh? And did not Yahweh change his mind about the disaster he pronounced against them? But we are about to bring great disaster on ourselves. So Jeremiah finds himself in a similar situation where they're pronouncing judgment, and the correct response is repentance, praying, we screwed up. Instead, they're like, how dare you, Jeremiah? You know, we're fine. God would never do such a thing. And he's using this illustration from Hezekiah and Isaiah's day to say, it's come back around again. And like there, here's an example of what should we should do and how God might respond, but you're choosing the wrong path. Either way. So, but just to be clear, so the, when you read it that time, it made it sound like the person praying was Hezekiah. I think this is a reference back to the Isaiah passage or the Isaiah event, at least. Yeah, I mean Hezekiah prayed. Yeah. Either way. He and entreated says, the Lord. Yes. And the Lord changed his mind. So right. That's like in so we have a narrative. You know, mm-hmm. account in Hezekiah's lifetime that's recorded in Isaiah, right. where judgment was coming, and then he entreated the Lord, and the Lord ended up delivering from Sennacherib's army. As Jeremiah is interpreting that same event, or something like it, yes, right, right, like you know, his interpretation of what happened is because of the prayer, the Lord changed his mind, right? Because the Isaiah passage doesn't say that God changed his mind; it just says Isaiah said, "God's heard you; you're going to be spared." Right? But here, Jeremiah makes it pretty clear, Hezekiah prayed to the people, and he repented, and then God changed his mind and did not bring that disastrous thing that Micah was talking about. So, like I said, there's a narrative of it, and then there's an interpretation of it that Jeremiah seems to think it had some effect, a pretty big effect, where it uh, reversed a course of action that was on the horizon. Yeah, And I like that we have two passages from two different perspectives, right? Even two different time periods yeah. Yeah. when they were years written. Later. Yeah. Where you kind of start to get a 3D image of the event, right, yeah. and and how God's place was interpreted inside of that event, because if you just had the Isaiah passage, you might say, well, God already right. decided, you know, that this was going to happen. It was just the unfolding of the plan, which is kind of interesting if you read Isaiah's prophecy after that. This is part of God's plan, <laughs> but within mm-hmm. that plan is. He doesn't have to toast Jerusalem just yet. Right. <laughs> and part of that is to bring them to repentance. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so the interpretation just says, all right, you could have read this as just a metaphor or just an analogy that wasn't rooted in any change that happened inside of God. But when you have a prophet who is interpreting the event and and leans into God changing his mind language to interpret it, now you have like two witnesses that are kind of going in the same direction. Yeah, and he's really trying to make the parallels. I mean, the point is, God's also proclaiming destruction against us, just like Micah did. Do we want to avoid that? Then maybe we should do exactly what we did last time. And so for him, there is, again, destruction right there, and there is one course of action, repentance and praying to God, just like they did before. But they they don't want to hear that. The leaders are not interested in what Jeremiah has to say about that. Yeah. Yeah. And partly because Jeremiah... He's saying there's nothing you can do at this point. <laughs> You've gone too far. The judgment is sure. coming. That's part of what makes him so unpopular. Um, Repentance not even an option at this point. But at least, at least this teaches us something about prayer, though. Like prayer can move God to do something to change His mind to bring about an outcome that He wasn't already planning to do. That's just how the text seems to right. interpret this event. Yep. Yeah, I think that we see that continuing into the New Testament where. Prayer still is viewed as something that moves God. Um, Were we going to hit a couple other uh, Old Testament examples? Were we? I'm sorry. I, did I skip over those? I We were talking about the Elijah passage. And oh, the, I forgot about the Elijah passage. The Daniel passage. passage. That's, I forgot about the Elijah one. That's why yeah. I was skipping ahead. Yeah, In the middle of Daniel, we have a chapter where Daniel is you know, interceding. He sees bad things on the horizon for, for God's people, and he's praying, and... Gabriel comes to him and says, you know, because you have done this, I was, God has heard your supplication, and he sent me to give you this word. Yeah. Um, 
and, and then, then he goes on to explain the revelation and the interpretation that Daniel was seeking. Um, but the point is, the way prayer is presented in that passage, it's that because God's people prayed, God activated <laughs> a messenger <laughs> right. to send a response to the prayer. And again, a God who is responding to prayer, they, we do, we act in a certain way, and God reacts in a certain way, is movement away from a God who experiences no change, has it all worked out uh, from the creation of the world, and what we do is ultimately not a game changer. Another example... Oh, you be. guys are looking at me. Sorry, I was looking down at my Bible. I didn't realize you were how looking dare you at me. Bible I know how during a podcast. you guys like that. Um, no, now we're going to Elijah. Elijah Let's do it. Right. I believe right. in you. Yeah, I'm already feeling like I'm, you know, holding us up here. But no, it's in First Kings chapter 17 where uh, Elijah is uh, prophesying to the people, and he's, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, that the reason they're having this famine is because of God, but. Uh, Elijah says to the people, as the Lord, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my word. It doesn't say by the Lord's word, he says by my word. And, the, and then God comes and, and speaks to him. But it's like, that same idea, it's like we want to put it all on God, but Elijah's like, no, you know, I have some say on this, and that he can't make it not rain. He doesn't have that kind of power. But evidently, there's some kind of relationship he has with God to where he can say, all right, God, I'm going to pray, and now I'm looking for rain to happen. And God will say, all right, you prayed, it's going to happen. It's not going to rain now, and, it will, and once you pray, I'll let it rain. Some kind of, the, like I said, some influence that Elijah has with God and the decisions that God is making there. Yeah, and this prayer of Elijah, which gets it to rain, is quoted in the book of James. Yeah. So mm-hmm. since we're talking about Elijah, uh, James 5, uh, verses 13 to 18, Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any of you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointed them with oil in the name of the Lord. Seems like we talked about this passage together recently. Seems like it. The prayer of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. The prayer will save them because the Lord will respond to the prayer and raise them up, presumably. Um... And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might rain. And for three years and six it months... It not rain. Thank you. <laughs> and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. So, you know, either we have to believe there's some kind of magic cause and effect between the clouds and our prayers, right, yeah. or it's God who's hearing the prayers and activating the clouds, or deactivating the clouds. <laughs> um, but so, you know, the prayer is presented as as if it's doing work that's moving God to act. And, and when you get to First Peter, there are a couple of passages that tell husbands, hey, treat your wives good so it doesn't negatively impact your prayers. Mm-hmm. Like, there are things we can do that can suck from our prayers, the ability to move God to act. Like, now God's like, no, I'm not going to answer your prayer because you don't treat your wife well. And here, he does answer the prayer of the righteous. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. I, I think that, that there's power and effectiveness to them means they effect change. If they don't affect change, why are we doing it? What's the point of prayer if we can't do anything with it? Yeah, yeah. and that's totally the logic right. of this verse. That's not just us reflecting on it. Like, James is saying, y'all should pray when people need to be forgiven and people need to be healed. And, you know, because when the righteous pray, it affects something. It is powerful. It, it causes an effect, and that effect is God acts in a way he wouldn't ordinarily have acted. And if anyone knew this better than anyone, it was Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so now we can go to the passage that I was trying to go Great for. Great transition. For. Yeah. Seamless. Well done. Yeah. You guys are better at that than I am. And so in the words of Jesus himself, we're looking at Luke chapter 11. Uh, The chapter begins with the disciples asking, you know, Jesus, you know, teach us how to pray. And so he kind of gives them a a, a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer in Luke's presentation here. But then Jesus continues on in verse 5, and he says, And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, 
Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, don't bother me. The door's already been locked and my children are in bed. I cannot give it up and give you anything. I tell you that even though he will not get up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So basically, keep knocking on the door till the guy gets up. Be annoying. Yeah, yeah, you know, be that guy. But Jesus continues on, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you, search and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Is there anyone among you who, if a, your child asked for a fish, you would give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asked for a, an egg, would you give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I just think that's kind of funny. It's like, so good. My, my, I can think of one of my grandkids coming and asking me, like, you know, can I have eggs for breakfast? Like, no, we're having scorpions today. Enjoy that, kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's just a very funny image in my mind. But I think what Jesus is doing here is reinforcing this idea that when we go to God and ask him for things, that God responds in kind, and he's a good God. He's a loving God. He doesn't give us different than what we ask for. He gives us what we ask for. But the whole point is, why pray in the first place if God already knows what we need and he's already planning on doing something about it? You know, there's something about this that suggests that our prayers are an essential part of our relationship with God, that if we want to see things happen, then we need to go to God in prayer, and that he does respond to our prayers. And in the absence of our prayer, is God going to say, you know, I'm just going to do it anyway because, you know, I am the unmoved mover? Or is there something essential here to say, no, if we want God involved in our lives, prayer is a key component of that. And so I just think it reinforces what we've been saying, that prayer is part of what moves God to act in this world. Yeah, it, when I talk to people about these topics and tangential topics, this idea that like prayer has got to do something, or it just turns into sort of a psychological thing that makes us feel better. And I, I hear people say that, though not in that way. They say, well, prayer changes me as much as it changes God. Okay... It can change you, but if it's some right, but but if it's not changing God, what are we doing here? Well, it reminds me of a line. um, I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie Shadowlands. It's about C.S. Lewis. I'm aware of the movie. I've not seen it. There's a line in the movie where um, C.S. Lewis's wife Joy is is sick, and he's praying for her, and he's talking to a friend. And the line he says is, "Prayer doesn't change God; it changes me." I'm like. There's some truth to that. Of course, I think prayer does change us. I think when we pray for people, it kind of changes our disposition towards those people. I'm not saying that's entirely wrong. The part that's wrong is saying that prayer doesn't change God. Like there's something about our prayers that move God. And to say that, yeah, when I pray, it has no effect on God seems to really misunderstand the process. Right. And right, I understand ch- like changing your disposition, changing, yeah. like coming, trying to find, get in alignment with God's will. But, um, but still, that there we just read a couple examples where right, yeah. clearly they prayed and God changed and did something different and responded to that prayer. And yes, there's a fine line between trying to manipulate God right, and just yeah. praying to God and becoming in alignment with God's will. But still, there's the, you pray in faith because you want something to happen, ideally good for someone, whether yeah. you know, in a sickness, an illness, or whatever it might be. And the I think the frustrating part for people, and perhaps why they retreat to the whole it changes me, not God, is... There's no clear understanding of why God does or doesn't. Sure. Right? Yeah. If there was, what we want is if I do these things, then I know God will respond in this way. Right? And that's ancient religion where you try to manipulate the deity, you do these certain things. And the Bible is not like that, where sometimes God relents and doesn't bring about these disasters, and then sometimes he just does. And um, maybe in retrospect, we can say why that might or might not be, but in the heat of the moment, like, you know, I'm praying for someone who has cancer and then they still die of cancer. I would like to know why, because yeah, I know God sure. doesn't like that. Um, but other times, miraculously, someone is cancer free because people prayed. And so th- I think that's part of the difficulty. So instead of saying, well, sometimes God will change his mind in response to prayer, we say, well, he doesn't. It's all set. And, and now we're just changing and accepting it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and those, that's a good way to kind of put it. You know, there's like two ways you can go. You know, either I pray and it gets the result, or I pray and it doesn't get the result, and therefore, like, either I believe prayer works and I'm frustrated for when it doesn't, Mm -hmm. or I just make the frustration go away by just, you know, ideologically being committed to prayer doesn't work 
on God yeah, right. to bring about <laughs> yeah. a different result. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, there's a third way in Scripture, and we see it in Jesus, and we see it taught in the book of James, which is we pray within God's will. Mm-hmm. We pray that that the thing we're asking would be God's will, that it would be compatible with God's will, that, you know, God, you already will the salvation of the world, and you will the effective missionary work of your people. Uh, we're asking you within your will to offer a healing, that, that this healing wouldn't go against something that you plan on doing with the sickness, but if it's compatible with your will, that you act to heal this person without getting in the way of some other higher purpose you have, mm-hmm. or, you know, well, anyway. Um, but, but to pray in alignment with God's will, knowing that the prayers that line up with his will have a greater chance of being answered yeah. than a prayer that would actually thwart what God is planning to do. Well, I think we can see prayer is, and part of it is just like opening up a dialogue with God. You know, and we're servants going to our, our Lord saying, hey, we think this is a great idea, or this is something we want. And, and God can say, you're right, that's a great idea, let's go with that, you know, because he has a wisdom that we don't have. He sees the bigger picture. And he can respond by saying, you know what, yeah, that aligns with it. Now, sometimes we pray for things, he's like, yeah, that's just not how I work, sure. But sometimes he can say, that's great, or he can come back and say, I understand why you want that, and, and in certain circumstances, that'd be a great idea, but I see a bigger picture where that's not going to help us help me to accomplish my bigger will. And so seeing prayer as opening a dialogue to say, God, this is what I'm praying for, but your will be done. And if you see something that I don't see, I'm still fully submitted to you to say, if the answer is no, it's because you are still a good God who has a good plan, and you just see what I don't see, and I accept that. Yeah. And that explains the difference between Isaiah and Jeremiah. Hmm. Like It was always God's will to shape and form Israel to be that light to the nations. And in the time of Isaiah... It was compatible with God's will to hold off the destruction of Jerusalem, to give Judah another chance to align their will with God's, and so he didn't allow Sennacherib to destroy the city. Um, And then, you know, Israel has a chance to rebound from that, to recover, to repent, to get on board with Torah. They don't. And so in the time of Jeremiah, you know, they just assume, well, it's always God's will to deliver Jerusalem from invaders. Well, no. This time, because things have changed, because you've hardened your hearts, you've had one of the worst kings hmm. um, kind of do some awful things in Israel, therefore the punishment's going to come. But it's not that God's will for Israel has changed. It's he was willing to relent from destroying them in the time of Isaiah, and by the time of Jeremiah, he was no longer willing to be moved to change that direction, all for the good of his overall big-picture plan. Right. And so that's what Jesus wrestled with in the garden. It's, Lord, if, if there's any other way I can get right. through to be your Messiah than going through this arrest, you know, and crucifixion, I, I'm I'm open to having you do something differently than <laughs> you've revealed so far. Yeah, who wouldn't be, right? <laughs> but if it's not, and this is the only way, well, your will be done. Yeah. You know, so it's it's kind of a tricky business. But what I love about the Luke passage you read is just, you know, the thing Jesus is talking about is prayer. And, you know, how should we pray to God? How should we consider our needs in relationship to his ability to meet them? And he comes up with an analogy, yeah. right? And you're talking about the analogical use of language. Like, Jesus is providing an analogy to illuminate <laughs> how we should think about prayer. And it's the analogy of a, a friend who's sleeping, who if you knock at their door and keep bugging them, you will get them to do something when they wouldn't have done it otherwise. Yeah. That's the analogy, Mm-hmm. That illuminates how we should think about God and prayer. So yeah, prayer, it's, you know, for people who have this view of a God who is not moved to act in new ways or different than he was already planning, the practice of prayer, the way it's presented in the Bible, just doesn't seem to be consistent with that view of God. Yeah, why bother? And what what's the benefit of it, really? If well, God I think, does not do anything. I think they would say, well, it's still good for us. You know, it doesn't change God, but it's good for us. And again, some truth to there. I'm not saying that that's totally off the wall, but I think it denies what the Bible is saying. You really have to play some gymnastics with what Scripture says to arrive at that conclusion. It's better to let Scripture be an accurate representation of God. Yeah, if we want to expand on this study, we could look at the practice of fasting. Mm-hmm. It's another practice if you study what Scripture says about it. The reason people fast is because they believe it will move God to act, 
And right. one of the greatest examples of that is, you know, Jonah and the Ninevites fasted. God said, <laughs> I'm going to destroy the city. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they fasted and they prayed. And God, in Jonah's language, God changed his mind. And Jonah thought that might happen because <laughs> God's done it so many times before. He might be doing it again now. And, and you have another example in David where uh, God pronounced the death of his son because of his affair with Bathsheba, right? And that the son bar- born of that marriage um, or that union <laughs> would um, uh, would die. Um, and like he fasted, he prayed, he had sackcloth, and he he just implored God not to allow his son to die. Right. And um, when God's like said no to that prayer, when God no, you're. <laughs> This is going to happen. You're not going to change my mind this time. As soon as the son died, he's done fasting. Yeah, He's like, well, there was a moment when I could have moved God to do something different. That moment's clearly over. No sense keeping on praying and fasting. Let's get back to life. Yeah. So his prayer style seems to confirm his conviction that his prayer and fasting could effect change. Yeah. Yeah, I love that Jonah passage. We had to fly through it last episode, yeah. but it does bring together those two things of like a prayer fasting or repentance idea, and then God changed his mind. And I, the whole point of Jonah is you have this reputation for changing your mind. That's what he says. <laughs> yes. yeah. Like, everyone knows you're going to do it. That's why I didn't want to come here, because I knew as soon as I did, they would actually do what they're supposed to do, and then you would like change your mind and not bring it. And that's, <laughs> like if he has a re- reputation for doing it, it implies, as not explicitly states, that God will do this on a regular basis. And uh, and I think we sort of fly by that because they're like we don't have thousands of cases in the Old Testament. From their perspective, they see God do it a lot. At yeah, least from Jonah's perspective, you are well known for this. Yes, and I know it better than anybody. Yeah, <laughs> doggone it, you did it again, <laughs> just like I thought. Yeah, so that, that's our big survey. <laughs> it's not a huge survey. We didn't. I mean, there were so many passages we could have looked at that we didn't. Sure, sure. Uh, but at least gets out there. You know, it, part of this study is interacting with the claims of. Uh, the Hayes book, uh, The Widening of God's Mercy, that, you know, God is presented in Scripture as changing and responding to humans in different ways, and that's part of the case they make for God having a changing view of of sex ethic for right. the people of God. Uh, and, you know, the evidence we see in the text is that, yeah, there, there's something right about their inclination to see God as moving, making changes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it makes the kind of changes they're talking about, uh, that's a different question that we'll return to. Um, but we need to, you can't do justice to this study unless you look at the passages that seem to indicate that God doesn't change, right? And we've shown plenty of passages that suggest he does. Um, yeah, we'll get to that in okay, a second. Okay, no yeah. problem. Uh, plenty of passages that suggest he does, um, but but our case that we see evidence for change needs to deal with the passages that mm-hmm. suggest that he doesn't change. So so now we have, I don't know, about eight or so, nine passages that use God doesn't change language, and you have to reckon with these passages, because sure. we don't get to just pick the scriptural testimony that agrees with our conclusion. We don't? We, <laughs> we have to also reckon with the passages that seem to push in a different direction. Oh, God, that just changes my whole approach, man. I've been teaching <laughs> wrong for, what, 30 years? Yeah, but uh, as Sam pointed out to me, there's one other point we need to bring up about God and change, and that is the whole business of the Word became flesh, mm. right? Jesus, we believe, Scripture teaches, is like God has become flesh and revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus. And the notion that God could at one point not be in flesh and at another point be in flesh... (laughs) Uh, implies a kind of change in God. His being is not so static and removed from the vicissitudes and changes of creation um, that he cannot enter into it and be born and depend upon food and have conversations and go through puberty and suffer and die. Like The way Scripture presents this is that God can do this, can enter into his creation in an interactive way, and the very fact of the Incarnation does away with a, a whole philosophical stream for understanding of God as being uh, not subject to change or immutable. Uh, he, he can and did in the person of Jesus. That's just the most blatant 
form of change any deity can undergo. And it just opens up the possibility that there have been other forms of change that he's subject to as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's this bizarre, this idea of like, if God can't ever change, then how can God become human? And then how can a human, but then I, I suppose they could say, well, he's 100% God still. So that's how he's not going to, like, but again, you get into these mental, logical, doctrinal gymnastics where I don't know how, you know, you make it all fit correctly. I mean, the reality is that when God became a human, that's a different thing happening. That's just not this immutable God who sits above everything with it all planned out. Um, and so I, I, I don't know. I struggle, I struggle to see the, the logic in that, in that view. Well, and I think that John is responding to something not all that much different than what we're responding not to nowadays, that people have a philosophical position, and then they try to bend Scripture to align with that position. You know, we kind of see it nowadays, but for John, you know, there are people who are becoming Christians, probably coming out of, you know, uh, Middle Platonism or Stoicism or whatever, and so they just have this idea of God, and they've been persuaded by the gospel. They're persuaded by the invitation to the kingdom and Jesus' identity, but they're not willing to totally give up some of these old ideas. And so they're preaching a Jesus who you know, didn't suffer, or didn't physically suffer, or didn't die, maybe didn't even have a physical body, but only appeared to have a body. It was called docetism, and we know it existed you know, 20 to 30 years after you know, John's gospel was written. And so you have people who are just, they're willing to go so far, but they kind of hit this wall philosophically. And so they've got to try to re-image Jesus in a way that accepts him as this Messiah, but doesn't quite violate their old ideas. Right. And so John's like, no, you've got to, you've got to die to those old ideas. Everything you thought about God has to, has to die, and you've got to rise to this new idea of God. And he makes it very clear in his gospel that Jesus did suffer. Like John's the only one who records that Jesus was stabbed in the side and blood and water flowed. And he made, he's so explicit. He's like, I was there and I saw it. And so these guys who are saying, well, Jesus doesn't suffer. He's like, I was there and saw it. You know, who are you going to believe? And so I think we still run into that. People have this preconceived idea growing out of some sort of philosophical commitment. And we have to respond in the same way and say, I understand that you're kind of struggling to, to bring these things to, into conversation. You might have to give up this philosophical commitment because it's undermining what Scripture has always said about God and what we've seen in Jesus. Yeah, this, this, this problem we're having here in 21st century America isn't all that much different than stuff that was happening almost 2,000 years ago. Yeah, I guess we're going to lead into the philosophy bit. We're not going to get to these other verses today. No chance. <laughs> no uh, chance. I'll also <laughs> go, go ahead. I, got, I also have another question we may not be able to cover today about Jesus and coming flesh, but we're on the philosophical thing, so go ahead. Um, yeah, so this kind of loops back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of the episode of only listening to half of the conversation with us and not getting pushed right. back. Like We can only interpret something in light of our prior frame of reference, yeah. right? And and so, you know, what people, when they approach the scriptures, when people approach even the doctrine of incarnation, like Jesus becoming flesh, as the early church fathers were wrestling with who Jesus was <laughs> and, and, and wrestling really with the question of whether God could actually become flesh, they could only do so against the background of the conceptual furniture in their head, mm -hmm. right? And the conceptual furniture they had, people from a Greek background, Right? The Jews didn't seem to wrestle with this. The Jewish Christians in the New Testament <laughs> didn't seem, because the conceptual furniture in their head was the Old Testament. Yeah, right. right? And they have a God who's changing his mind, interacting, listening to prayer. Like, Showing for them, up as a fire, you know. <laughs> yeah, for them, like, Jesus becoming flesh, like, God becoming flesh in Jesus just didn't violate their worldview, because the Old Testament is just ha presents God as interacting dynamically with creation. But as people not from a Jewish background interact with, your religion says God became flesh, that's dumb. <laughs> yeah. Because philosophically, we all know, this is from their perspective, not ours, uh, we know, uh, you know, either from Aristotle's view that, you know, the unchanging God is the basis of, of how life can be maintained and have some semblance of stability in an ever-changing world. Like, for them, the notion of constancy and change is a, 
big philosophical conundrum in the history of philosophical studies up until the first century was wrestling with constancy and change. And, you know, Aristotle's answer is, well, you know, at the end of it, there's one thing that never changes, that is the ground of all being, and that is God, you know? And so for them, you know, this notion of God becoming flesh, they really, they so much believe that God's unchanging, unmoving, impassable, immutable being, aseity, is the basis of how our changing world is held together, that if you start introducing the notion of a God who experiences change, change at all, it just throws them off. Their whole worldview gets turned upside down. And so the Greeks who came to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they just had to wrestle with this, and why some are saying he can't be God. <laughs> you know, Arius. The reason why Arius, you know, who became later branded as a heretic, he just, God had to be a, Jesus had to be a creature. There has to be a time when Jesus was not and then came into being. And so he posits Jesus as like the very first of creation, mm -hmm. right? And that through him, um, all other creation can kind of flow and, and happen. And, and God can interact in a world of change through Jesus because Jesus is not the unchanging creator being. He is a creature who can interact with the world of change and creaturehood in a totally divine way, because he's the first at, and one and only divine creature, you know? So, but that got him in big trouble. <laughs> right. And, and Athanasius, who is kind of his theological opponent, is saying, you can't say that about Jesus, because that's not biblical enough. Jesus is not presented in the Bible as being a creature. He is very much presented in a oneness with God that transcends creaturehood but yet took on creaturehood. And so he had to appeal to the categories of philosophy. In this case, Stoicism had an answer for this issue, and it is the notion of the Logos, that the unchanging God that is the basis of all being is there, but from the, from the origin of this unchanging God's existence, he has exuded his Logos, his divine self, Radi has been always radiating from himself, and that radiance from God uh, is itself the agent that brings creation into existence and interacts with the created order. And so the logos of the unchanging God can interact in a world of change and touch the world of change and get involved in all that without the ground of creation, God himself, actually experiencing any of that change, <laughs> right? And so Athanasius kind of borrowed that conception and say, well, that's the way it is with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like God, to use theological language, God the Father hasn't ever changed, right? But he has eternally exuded the Son. And so uh, it's the Son who has always been coming forth from the Father who is God's agent of creating the world, and Jesus can get his hands dirty without the Father being implicated in all that change. And so he is divine. He has eternally exuded from the divine in a way that can interact with the world of change while keeping God's hands kind of clean. And so he used the philosophy of Stoicism and their answer to the change and constancy dilemma and question in philosophy. It just became helpful categories to solve the Trinitarian issue while maintaining... <laughs> Um, the theological, the philosophical commitment to an unchanging God. So these are the issues, right? Yeah. That and, and if that's part of your conceptual world, lots of people who were kind of, they read apologetic books, and one of the proofs for God is being real and existing is, you know, the philosophy of Aristotle seems to be fulfilled by the God of Scripture, right? And the proofs for God's existence uh, that Aquinas used, built off of some Aristotelian foundations, and that's part of people's conceptual furniture is, these attributes of the divine become imported into the scriptures, right? And then we look for verses that match up to divine attributes that existed already in Greek philosophy. So it's an apologetic approach to show that the God of scripture actually fulfills the best insights of the philosophy of the day. Um, and it can't be overstated enough that first century Jews just didn't have this problem <laughs> because they didn't have... Greek philosophy as the conceptual furniture in their mind. They had the Old Testament scriptures. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a, a metaphor analogy to that sort of Stoic view like of Jesus as like agent for God. 
and I can't I can't think of I don't know I can't think of anything like that that might be helpful to our listeners that to to, to you know to explain what you're talking about where he's still like from God but he's an agent of God so like what happens to Jesus doesn't happen to God the Father right and so I don't know I do think of like Jesus's parable about you know, he sends servants and they kill him and then like well he sends his son and they kill him but like the master is just over here sending people and what they do is like you know it may make him quote mad I mean I'm sure Stokes wouldn't say that but it doesn't like actually affect him physically or in other ways. Yeah, the Cappadocian fathers of the early church had all sorts of analogies to illustrate Trinity, and they're trying to illustrate the very thing you're trying to illustrate, yeah. and all of them really frustrate people. But <laughs> really? <laughs> they use like the language of the sun, like yeah. we're impacted by the sun's rays, it uh-huh, comes in contact right. with our skin, but none of us is like touching the sun. Yeah. Like the sun, you know, the rays come forth on the earth and impact things here in the creaturely realm without anything down here actually, you know, coming remotely close to the actual sun itself. But Jesus is like the rays from the sun, but the Father is like the sun himself. That's kind of the kinds sure. of analogies yeah, they tried right. to use that always end up breaking down the more you push them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing about analogies. They're great up to a point, but yeah, you just push them hard enough and eventually they fail. And that's kind of what it is to talk about God. We do the best we can, you know, using our experiences and our language and stuff. And we come to a point where it's just like, we've done what we can do. Just understand that everything's going to fall a little bit short. You know, that's okay. You know, God's God. If we could understand him, we would be equal to him. But we still want to be faithful to his revelation and not say things that would be a violation of that. That's just it. I think sometimes people are a little bit too comfortable with going beyond what God has actually revealed about himself. And so, and that's when we start saying things that are probably just not true. Probably absolutely not true. So just to be clear, what you're saying is that if Jesus is actually God and came down in flesh, that means that God can change, that God is not stuck in this one thing. even Because we're, we're saying that, that that philosophy you're discussing is, is just not viable scripturally or well, at times logically. But and and so if that's if, if we jettison that, then what we're left with is a God who has uh, changed form, changed interaction with humanity to come down as Jesus. So which yeah. it backs up what we've been talking about in other scriptures that say God, the O T God, you know, changes, but now they see N T God also changing. Yeah. And and again this would be consistent with the Old Testament. Like God speaks to humans like he right. he comes to visit abraham with yeah. two, with two angels right like it's not just you know some people can say well god never changes interaction every time people interacted with what they thought was god it was really an angel but the way the revelation about isaac being born was it's like god was speaking and he had two of his messengers with him yeah <laughs> and it's like the one speaking to him wasn't a third messenger it was god right like, so god right. reveals himself through in human forms, mm-hmm. surrounded by angels, like burning bush, mm-hmm. like pillar of fire, pillar, cloud. you know, like oh, there's all sorts of things where God in the Old Testament is interacting. So, for the Christians of a Jewish background, like the incarnation didn't change anything for them about their view of God. Mm-hmm. It's just now he's becoming flesh like a human, which is crazier than all the previous sure. ones, right? Next level, but yeah. next level, but. Uh, at the end of the day, it worked. You know, it's. I think the logos approach is intellectually coherent, which is why it converted a bunch of Greeks. Like, mm-hmm. For them, the logos explanation of Jesus worked. Uh, but if you're going to embrace that, <laughs> yeah. you can't just say, you can't just say that of Jesus. You got to go back into the Old Testament and say, well, if Jesus is the only form of God that can interact with creation, then the Father wasn't doing anything in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Every time, like any kind of deity was interacting, you know, with the people, it was actually the Logos, the emanation. Mm. And so that you don't just have Jesus in the New Testament. It was Jesus or what became Jesus. Right. Or called what became called Jesus, <laughs> right, in the New Testament is the sum total of all the divine interactions throughout the entire Scripture. I don't love that, but I hear what you're <laughs> right. yeah, you're, for consistency's sake. So you yeah, it is that. intellectually right. consistent, I right. think. Um, it's just, do we have? Is that the way Scripture presents Jesus? So that you know, for instance, at his baptism, where like the Spirit is hovering down, and then the Father speaks from heaven, right? Exactly. And the Son is the one getting wet. Like, there's three different persons. If logos theology was right, there's actually, it actually ends up being modalism. 
It's yeah, the logos in three forms: logos as Father, logos as Spirit, and logos as Son. Yeah. None of them is God the Father. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, that was a philosophical rabbit hole. I wasn't sure we were going to go down. <laughs> and <laughs> yet we did. we did. And we lost the majority of our listeners, but we made it anyway. <laughs> well, once you have your theological, your philosophical answer satisfies you, uh, then it's not hard to go back to the scriptures and find passages that, ap- that appear to support the unchanging God right. view. And that's what we'll dedicate the entire next episode to. What are the right. passages that suggest God doesn't change? And if we believe that he does at some level then do we have an answer for them? Do we have an explanation that is consistent with our approach? Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for joining us in this episode of the After Class Podcast, After Class Because... The best conversations happen. After Class. Thank you again for listening to the Afterclass Podcast. ACP is hosted by Sam Long, John Nugent, and Ron Peters. Audio production is provided by Drew Nyquist, and social media is managed by Darren Harris.